Hey guys, no thank you here. This is my dissertation that I said I would post on YouTube ages ago and never got around to posting. So, uh, if it sounds a bit weird, it's because it was originally meant to be dissertation. So there's lots of citations and stuff that doesn't really make sense in a video essay. It's also not going to be any visuals, so I recommend you just tab over and, you know, do whatever you want to do. But, uh, yeah, this is, this is me reading out my dissertation. Sonic Futures in Serial Experiments Lane and Beyond Introduction In this paper, I will discuss the question, how are sonic futures constructed and presented in Serial Experiments Lane? To elaborate, I hope to explore the diegetic and non-diegetic soundtrack in Serial Experiments Lane, hereafter SEL, in order to understand how those sounds function with regards to the show's unique near-futurism. I will contextualize this discussion within a philosophical framework, including that of the Cybernetic Culture Research Unit, CCRU, drawing connections between their adjacent views on science fiction, cybernetics, and acceleration. In order to do this, I will be referring, in addition to the text of SEO itself, to a variety of literature surrounding SEO and pertaining to relevant philosophy, including those related to the CCRU, such as Kodo Eshin and Nick Land, but also beyond to Deleuze and Guattari. Let me define some terminology here. In the universe of SEL, there is a network equivalent to the internet called the Wired. A computer used to connect to the Wired is called a Navi. If one has the right setup, the Wired can function as a Gibsonian cyberspace, that is to say one can enter it as a sort of virtual reality. But the main thematic focus of the show centers on the interaction between the two realms of the Wired and the real world, which I will refer to as meat space. The reason I will not just refer to meat space as the real world is because one of the major themes of the show is the Baudrillardian breakdown of the distinction between the real and the virtual, Baudrillard 1983, represented by Protocol 7, a semi-mythical program which will integrate the wired into meat space until there is no line between them. I have chosen the term meat space based on the paper Hello from the Wired, an introduction to cyber nihilism by N1X, uh, next 2016 which is not really relevant to the scope of this paper, but I figure it's worth mentioning as a source of lingo. SEO aired as 13 episodes, each one entitled Layer 01, Layer 02, and so on. As stated, SEO has three CDs worth of OST. Serial Experiments Lane soundtrack, which contains mostly guitar-based songs, including the opening and closing themes. Serial Experiments Lane soundtrack Siberia mix, which mostly contains the, some of the more genre-focused electronic songs and Serial Experiments Lane Bootleg, which houses ambient and experimental music, uh, also mostly electronic. I'll be focusing mainly, although not exclusively, on the Bootleg CD, as this is where the more unique and idi idiosyncratic sounds are to be found, and also, in my eyes, the most representative of sonic futures. First, I will discuss literature related to science fiction music, philosophy of musical futurism, and the philosophy of SEO's narrative. Then I will critically discuss the literature, and in addition, I will posit my own analysis. I feel this is necessary because there is no existing literature on this particular subject, so I will be drawing from a variety of sources in order to come to my own conclusions. However, an entirely conclusive analysis is beyond the scope of this paper and more research is needed. Literature Review I ask, in the creation of Sonic Futures, what techniques are established, which does SEL draw upon, and to what effect are they used? Schmidt, 2010, states that the conventions of representing alien beings, times, and or spaces through the electronic, the atonal, or dissonant have been more or less continuous from the roughly 1950 to the present. This focus on electronics and atonality certainly holds true for SEL, and Schmidt expresses the idea of a popular avant-garde in sci-fi scoring, that is, techniques and instrumentation inspired by the existent musical avant-garde transplanted into a filmic context as representation of the unfamiliar and alien concepts which form the very base of sci-fi. More relevant to the time period of SEL, she comments on the score of The Matrix, noting of its industrial techno soundtrack, there could, not be any, there could not possibly be any music more appropriate to depict a virtual world built and maintained by machines, inhabited by human consciousnesses. The Matrix is the epitome of what I consider to be the cyborg nature of science fiction film. Importantly, she emphasizes that these electronic conventions of science fiction scoring did not appear out of nowhere. Quote, they were in fact borrowed at more than one point from the musical avant-garde. Schmidt brings up the work of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, in particular Rob Grainer's composition of the Doctor Who theme, but notably omits mention of Delia Derbyshire's incredible work rendering that composition through Tomball sound design via tape splicing. 
In Music and Science Fiction Television, Donnelly and Howard described Derbyshire's arrangement as an iconic piece of electronic music. Derbyshire's influence on electronic music is not to be understated. In fact, I recently discovered deep in the caverns of YouTube an obscure track of hers, Dance from Noah, Derbyshire 1971, which bears remarkable resemblance to the techno and grime which would evolve decades later. In fact, the sparse, atmospheric, but often strongly rhythmic compositions of Delia Derbyshire are certainly not far from the ambient side of the SEL bootleg CD. Back into the SEL soundtrack, from start to finish, the breakbeat is unavoidable. Some fascinating insight can be drawn from Cold War Eshun's book, More Brilliant Than the Sun, Adventures in Sonic Fiction, Eshun 2018. Eshun writes on breakbeat, The breakbeat drives new pathways through the brain. Aggressively unpitched, it blocks empathy while fissuring new synapses through the matter of the mind. As it fires across the synaptic junction, the sensorial flinch is translated backwards, reinvested in the old age values of refinement and sensibility, to the rear march. He positions himself against beatless future music, saying, quote, The music of the future is weightless, transcendent, and neatly converging with online disembodiment. Holst's Planet Suite as used in Kubrick's 2001, Eno's Apollo soundtrack, Van Gelis's Blade Runner soundtrack, all these are good records, but sonically, sonically speaking, they're as futuristic as the Titanic, nothing but updated examples of an 18th century uh, sublime. Whereas, quote, Far from abandoning rhythm, the futurist producer is the scientist who goes deeper into the break, who crosses the threshold of the human drama in order to investigate the hyperdimensions of the dematerialized breakbeat. To Ashun, breakbeat is a clandestine science, escaped from the lad and hiding out in the bedrooms of future-thinking producers around the world. One idea... Uh, what, one key to Shun's writing is his idea of text rhythm, that is, the new ideology of rhythm which interprets the rhizomatic break, beats of a break as totality, opposed to processing any hit as singular. This textual processing of rhythm is post-lingual and even post-craniocentric. Quote, the sensory motor reflexes of the body are centuries ahead of minds still locked into dead traditions. The body is a distributed brain, a big brain whose zones are nonetheless separated from each other by centuries, inherited habits. The text rhythms of the breakbeat cannot be understood without the parallel processing power of a distributed mind-body. While Ashun here is referring to the physicalities of text rhythmic comprehension, presumably through dance and adjacent expressions, the same notion could be transposed onto SEL's distributed cybernetic conception of consciousness. Counter to the traditions of science fiction scoring described by Schmidt, one which draws, a, uh, one which draws upon the classical, classical avant-garde and orchestral synth compositions, Ishin envisions a sonic Afrofuturism with hyperrhythmic post-human intricacies and psychedelic conceptions of time malleability. Quoting jungle musician, a guy called Gerald, Ashun writes, We have advanced to a level where we can control time sonically by stretching a sound. We play with time. Simpson, 1995. Rhythm is positioned as something more than its component parts, transcending melody, beat, even temporality. Ashun identifies the heteronym, saying, The producer disappears into each alter ego, but the machinate name is not a pseudonym, a fake name. Rather, it's a heteronym, a many name, one in a series of parallel names which distributes and disperses you into the public secrecy of open anonymity. Following this up with, in the, line, in the 70s, Bowie heteronyms, Major Tom, Aladdin Sane, Thin White Duke, were serial. Now heteronyms come in parallel. Today, the, future produce, the futurist producer is always greater than one. This parallels Lane's wired selves and, in a broader sense, SEL's conception of identity. All lane, yet separate. Now we've established a musical context with which to analyze Sonic Futures, let's move on to the show itself. How can we interpret SEL the show? SEL is not typical of any single one of its component parts. Not typical anime, typical cyberpunk, or sci-fi. As Prindle 2015 puts it, uh, SEL does not, quote, neatly fit in the existing genres of cyberpunk, mecha, or fantasy. While I'm here, I would like to briefly point out that this, this text makes a minor mistake. In a footnote, Prindle states, quote, there are two reigns in this anime. In Visual Experiments Lane, uh, unquote, in Visual Experiments Lane, various 1998, an art book creators is complementary to the show. On page 43, we can see that there are actually three lanes, with the third lane being written in Roman characters as Lane. This third lane is the evil lane we see throughout the show, who taunts Lane of the analog with her characteristic sinister grin. 
Jackson 2012 takes yet another approach. Uh, Jackson positions Lane as being in opposition with a Cartesian identity, mapping Lane's identity onto the topology of a non-Cartesian finite universe, which would mathematically create, quote, virtual duplicates. Jackson asks, quote, could there be a sense in which these copies of Lane are explicable not as incomplete scraps of a single fragmented identity, but as distorted images of herself received across a uh, universe of noise, unquote. He uses the example of the game Pac-Man, quote, if Pac-Man pauses activity long enough to look through the corridor joining the left part of the screen to the right, he would look off into the distance and see himself, and further on there would be yet another image of himself, and so on. In this way, Jackson frames the multiple lanes as defined by repetition rather than difference. Gonzalez Torrance, 2015, takes a different approach, uh, focusing on SEL's temporality by way of Deleuze. Quote, in a way, we can see serial experiments lane as an example of what Deleuze refers to as time image, says Gonzalez. Quote, serial experiments lane presents the passing of time directly instead of representing it. But rather than doing this through reference to a promised change, it is accomplished by playing with inaction, slow times, and the tension inherent to the still image. In other words, by focusing on time itself and not in movement. End quote. Though the narrative and director, uh, through the narrative and directorial pace of the show, SEO is able to actually present time, not merely a mediated representation of time in the form of movement. When, in layer 02, a person takes the drug Acela, it speeds up the processing speed of their brain and consequently their perception of time. This creates a, quote, time within time, and this other time allows potentialities of other futures. After all, the secondary effect of Acela is that it increases the user's connectivity to the wired. This positions the wired itself, which, as Gonzalez puts it, quote, represents virtuality and potentiality, end quote, directly adjacent to a conception of Deleuzian time image. Relevant to the philosophy of SEO is the work of the CCRU. The CCRU conception of Baudrillardian theory fiction, Zemake 2014, this is, uh, this is a helpful lens through which to view SEO. Oh, fuck, I just, oh, fuck, that's a little typo. I just submitted this as my dissertation. There's a fucking tiny typo in it. I'm going to die. Uh, cy- quote, cyberspace exploration contacts an imageless body. Touching the black mirror, absolute destratification at 0k, hacks metric space and rewrites the operating system. Fluid attritional jungle cultures smear into machinic continuation. Land 2011. Land's speculative realist take on cyberspace closely resembles the perspective taken by SEO itself, a radically non-anthropocentric gothic nihilism. The central thesis of acceleration, uh, theses of accelerationism align with SEO and converge on posthumanism. Particularly relevant is hyperstition, a, neolo- a neologism of hyper and superstition. This describes ideas which manifest themselves which manifest themselves, something which starts as a fiction, meme, or superstition, which via a, cult, a cultural and possibly a cult f- positive feedback loop uh, brings themselves into existence, essentially the process by which an idea successfully functions as its own catalyst, blueprint, source code for realization. Is Lane herself in some way a hyperstitional existence? Schmidt's historical analysis of music and science fiction media shows that the electronic, atonal, and dissonant sounds of the avant-garde have found a comfortable home in science fiction as used to represent the alien or unfamiliar. Kodo Eschen proposes a newer system of analysis and understanding for electronic music which positions rhythm as the center of electronic music as a sort of Afrofuturist occultic science. He shows that in the context of breakbeat, the concept of rhythm doesn't quite capture the actual experience and reframes it as ke- texture rhythm, something which is understood in a temporal, in a temporal totality. He also mentions the beatlessness of many white European attempts at futurism as contrasted by the hyperrhythmic futurism of artists such as a, a guy called Gerald. Uh, Prindle shows how SEL does not fit into the traditions of many pre-existing genres in anime. Jackson theorizes that the topology of Lane's self can be mapped onto a non-Cartesian finite identity, and Torrance demonstrates SEL's conception of time by way of time image. Finally, accelerationist theories of the CCRU give us a theoretical window into the future adjacent to SEL, which can help us to contextualize discussion on sonic futures. Method. Which methods are best to understand SEL's creation of sonic futures? I'll be drawing on the previously outlined analysis of SEL's philosophy and historical conceptions of sound in science fiction. I'll be taking a look at literature I've previously mentioned, connecting, contrasting, and critiquing it with regards to SEL's sonic futures. However, as previously stated, SEL does not easily fit within the frameworks of other anime or science fiction. Therefore, the sonic components of the text cannot be analyzed strictly using the scaffolds which may be commonly applied to more traditional works. Lane herself 
demonstrates elements of dissociative identity disorder, and the overall text's heavy focus on multiplicity parallels schizophrenia. I will thereby be looking at the music through a perspective inspired by the techniques of schizoanalysis set up by Deleuze and Guattari in Anti-Oedipus, Deleuze and Guattari, 1972, which I find to be the most fitting for a work as focused on the schizo as SEL. As well as this, I will be drawing from CCRU-inspired works, basing my style on the approach taken by Ashurnin More Brilliant Than the Sun and Mark Fisher's writings on artists such as Berio on the te- Caretaker in his book Ghosts of My Life, Writings on Depression, Hauntology, and Lost Futures, Fisher 2014. I have chosen this approach because the philosophy of the CCRU ties thematically with both my research question and uh, the themes of the text itself, namely cybernetics, futurism, post-humanism, and identity. This can even be seen in the slogan, quote, the CCIU does not, has not, and will never exist, CCIU 2018. Even the very nature of the unit negates the singular identity. This, in my mind, is the most appropriate lens with which to view SEL. My approach will involve a schizoanalysis of the music of SEL operating outside, although incorporating elements of techniques of music theory, tombow analysis, how was the sound made, or, future, or, or film theory. I will focus on an emotive and philosophical exploration of sound relating back to the key question on the creation of sonic futures. I'll be producing my own analysis of the text, making up for the lack of existing literature in this area, although I would like to emphasize that this will be far from a comprehensive look at the subject and further research into this area is needed. I will attempt to draw rhizomatic connections between sound, future, SEO as theory fiction, existing literature, and the narrative of the text. This is necessary to properly get at the text, and in particular to understand its creation of sonic o- of, uh, futures. More standard musical analysis is not generally interested in the future. It faces towards the past, as, Neely t- as Adam Neely puts it, the harmonic style of 18th century European musicians. A materialist approach to analyzing the tombo of synths is not necessarily the most valid one in this particular situation, due as stated to the nature of the text and the research question. How can a future be derived by simply looking at the creation of a sound or the mechanics of its harmonies without a philosophical narrative and emotional context to place those sounds within? I will, however, try not to stray too far away from concrete analysis as to get completely lost in the hypostitional. Critical Discussion The music of SEO in some ways follows the historical precedent established by Schmidt. The sounds of SEO show a strong focus towards the atonal and electronic. Let's listen to Streetcar, Akira 2000. We can hear that the song is incredibly, almost uncomfortably sparse. These unusual sounds and avant-garde techniques do fit within the blueprint of science fiction music Schmidt lays out. However, as I will discuss, there are additional factors relating to rhythm, sound design, and genre which also serve to separate SEL uh, from this tradition of science fiction scoring. The result is the best of both worlds, the tried and tested proven effectiveness of the popular avant-garde approach, and a new texture-rhythmic rugged editions uh, which set SEL apart from the mainstream, appropriate for the show's off-kilter directing and hypnagogic pacing. The relation of SEL as cyberpunk centers clearly around Club Siberia. Siberia represents perfectly the high-tech, low-life dichotomy at the heart of cyberpunk as described by Bruce Sterling in his preface for William Gibson's Burning Chrome. It is the bridge between the realm of the wired and meat space, both metaphorically and, as revealed in Layer 09, literally. The music in Siberia contains a special property which breaks down the barrier between meat space and the wired, between the real and the virtual. However, even outside the music, Siberia serves a similar purpose, a space for young hackers and miscreants to converge without the trappings of a real-life identity. This idea is reflected in the way Lane's friends uh, interacts with Siberia. In order to go there, they get dressed up, changing their physical form by their will to present an idea, ideal, imagined version of themselves, mirroring the way one creates a virtual persona or identity in the Wyatt. In Layer 09, Lane plays a song which contains those frequencies which break down the barriers between worlds. Fittingly, the song is, self, the song is simply titled Track 44. The title is as impersonal as the song itself, a thumping, fast-paced industrial acid techno track. To modern ears, it represents the retro-futurism of the 90s, but at the time of airing, this would have been the cutting edge of of the underground club scene. However, the song is not simply a recreation of the contemporary conventions of its era. It twists those conventions into a vision of a virtual future. The the four-on-the-floor kicks and acid bass line are interspersed at first with an otherworldly vocal sound, a vague memory of Gregorian choir somehow emerging from within a cacophony of accelerated machinery. Something sacred lies deep under the cover of a cybernetic future. 
Of course, this calls back to the running themes of Lane as a religious figure, the character of Masami Eri, the creator of the Rogue Protocol 7 which merges the Wired and Meat Space, who ascended to live as a god in the Wired after committing suicide. The choral sound and kick drum fade from memory as a female voice begins speaking, but her words are lost beneath layers of processing and machinic noise. We hear only the texture of her voice, the timbre of her calm but confident tone, unintelligible and impersonal, even inhuman and yet distinctly feminine, reflective of SEL's view on the Wired as a whole with Lane as its true goddess. Before you know it, the kick drum returns and is soon accompanied by a baffling three-note arpeggio which seems to repeatedly bubble up from beneath the surface of the soundscape. This is achieved through a rising volume and opening up low-pass filter, so that the sound progresses from dark, muted, and quiet to sitting atop the mix to mix bright and airy with high frequencies before coming back down. The sound itself seems to have a drooping pitch on the attack. The notes start slightly above themselves before rapidly dropping to their true pitch. This gives the entire sound an out-of-tune, off-kilter effect. Although it's perfectly in key, playing the same notes as the bass line in fact, FGA, the unstable microtonality distances it from the comfortably sterile 12-tone equal temperament our ears are used to hearing. This places the notes outside of familiar reality, creating an atmosphere adjacent to the discomfort of the new, a fitting emotional parallel with the oppressively manic atmosphere of the liminal space which is Club Siberia in the show. The synth line changes, the same bubbling texture as before, but with a slower pattern of a repeated perfect, fi- perfect fifth, and a new tonality arises in the background, a digital whale song modulating smoothly chromatically downwards in a vague pitch from roughly C to A. All of a sudden, the acid bass line changes, but you only have 12 bars to get used to it before the entire song instantly drops out, leaving only some bare shaker hi-hat-like production swimming in an ambient drone, the rich tonality of which reminds me of the Prophet 5 synthesizer, although I'm not sure that's what that was actually used for the song. The female voice returns again, clearer now, a few words and phrases can be made out. You better believe it's real, no matter if you believe it or not. Finally, the track fades out, implying a DJ in Siberia ready to mix into the next hard-hitting track, the music never-ending, the hypnotism of frequencies which manifest Protocol 7 continuing on indefinitely. What I find interesting about this approach to speculative futurist composition is the juxtaposition against modern future-facing genre. In recent memory, the two modern equivalent genres would be Vaporwave and PC music slash hyperpop. Both of these genres are highly hauntological, Vaporwave with its nostalgia for and recontextualization of 80s and 90s corporate aesthetics, and PC music with its reverence uh, oh, for uh, 1000, 2000s pop music. For both of, these, uh, both of these genres present a vision of a lost future, the promised tomorrow in contrast with the actuality of today. What is to me so interesting about SEL's speculation is that there is no hauntology. It is a genuine attempt to extrapolate from the present and create a new future, rather than an attempt at reproducing a future which never arrived. The complete rejection of hauntology produces an additive sonic future, that is to say creating future constructively, adding on to what is already here. One could argue that this in fact that this is in fact the retro future which hauntology recuperates. However, by virtue of both subtlety and uniqueness, as well as to some extent existing in a niche of culture, it seems that this hasn't yet taken place. It appears that modern trend gestures towards the lost futures of 2000s trance and pop rather than the darker cyber-gothic industrial sounds of SEL. This decision means that track 44 still feels like something that one could genuinely find playing in a dingy club Siberia somewhere right now, in a vision of in a version of the near future SEL was speculating about. Next, let's examine some non diegetic soundtrack, again composed by Akira Takemoto. The more ambient sound of SEL's bootleg CD contains a heavy focus on percussion, particularly what sound like tabla drums or otherwise drums which aren't the kick, snare, hi-hat drum textures one might be used to. These are overlaid with strange electronic sound design. Occasionally there are brief glimpses of traditional instrumentation such as pianos and guitars, but mostly the focus is placed on an abstract soundscape. Take the song Ectoplasm. An alien choir sings a lilted melody as their voices are drowned out by an icy synth tone, almost mocking their organic singing with a cybernetic sing-song. The attack time on the synth is long enough that it could not be construed as percussive, but not so long as to become a pad or gentle string sound. Rather, it sits at an odd between length, echoing the tempo of a panting chant or very aggressive violin playing. Although the timbre recalls perhaps a flute or other wind instrument, perhaps this is what the panting breathiness aims to conjure up, the rhythmic breath of a machine. Meanwhile, unnatural clockwork percussion hits on every eighth note, creating a frantic pace, 
but the emphasis is syncopated and, and, and asymmetric, not letting you get comfortable in a familiar groove. All of this is then consumed by a rising drone mixed in with what sound like dogs barking and some atemporal percussive sound. Perhaps they are synthetic, perhaps from a field recording. Once more, the barrier between the worlds of the real and virtual collide destructively, placing the listener in a biomechanical uncanny valley of sound. The refusal to concede ambient non-rhythmic texture ring means that the sound of SEO has strong temporality, musically reflecting Gonzalez Torrance rather than a Brian Eno attempt at or craft a, rather than a Brian Eno a temporality or craftwork moment form. Lane refuses to represent time, it directly placing the listener within a Deleuzian time image versus via sparse percussion. Take the track Siberia B. This is by all accounts a drungle track. Funky bass line, not just a standard side wave sub, but a real bass line which contains within itself the funk. Then boom, you've got this wild flow to you synthy running arpeggios in reverb's bass. This is the common feature of the soundtrack, just like in t- track 44. Take an existing genre at the front facing edge of electronic music, strip it down and add some ethereal alien cloudy element which elevates the whole track and pushes it past the barrier of today. But then compare that with Cure Thy Lane, another mood entirely. We are no longer in Siberia, the limbo connecting worlds. We're fully in the wired now, but the drums haven't left. They're still there and they still refuse to be anything other than unusual. Just as Torrance states about directing, quote, playing with inaction, slow times, the tension inherent to the still image, SEL's slow time text rhythms don't just show temporality or try to ignore it. They explicitly are time. The entire analysis of text rhythm relies on extended temporalities. It is precisely because we perceive the break or 909 pattern not as individual hits that the holistic hyperrhythm emerges. The text rhythms of Lane and radically non-Western. This brings me to ask, is it still orient- Orientalism when it was made in the East? On the one hand, well, you, you could argue that although the sounds were created in the East, they depend on a cinematic and sonic language which stems from America and Europe, so they are still on the Orientalist because the genre is an expat. On the other hand, this isn't strictly true. Japanese cinema was certainly incredibly influential on the medium as a whole, Ozu of course being a prime example, and Japanese electronic musics have been right at the cutting edge ever since Yellow Magic Orchestra in 1979. I say this is not Orientalism, rather an attempt from the outside to break free from American and European musical conventions. Yasuyuki Ueda said in an interview that SEL was, quote, a sort of cultural war against American culture and, Amer- uh, and the American sense of values we, Japan, adopted after World War II, Ueda 2004. Because of this evidence, I conclude that the omission of Western and American drum textures from the soundtrack was a deliberate act of radical de-Westernization from the producers of the show. Jackson, 2012, seems intent on mathematizing identity, but fails to realize how this completely goes counter to SEL's conception of the self. In the paper, he refers to a scene where Lane is in the wired and walks through space full of of two rolls of pseudo-lanes, and points to this as proof of the non-Cartesian geometry where Lane sees herself repeated. I will then, in critiquing Jackson, use his same metaphor as Pac-Man, of Pac-Man. Uh, Pac-Man would indeed see himself if he looked off to one side. Why then does Lane not see herself, but a series of dolls in that scene then? If you actually pay attention to the show, they're not even conscious, just dolls, facsimiles of Lane, not at all relatable to the real thing beyond a surface level appearance, and even then they show a face but wear different clothes. Would Pac-Man see other Pac-Mans with different clothes without movement or self? Okay, so say we ignore that. Okay, so say we ignore that scene and propose that the two other lanes, Lane of the Wired and Evil Lane, are the non-Cartesian repetitions of Lane Jackson is talking about. Again, how does this make any sense given the content of the show? How could a repeat of the original Lane's consciousness be acting completely independently from Lane? Surely there would be just one Lane in multiple places. But these are clearly separate Lanes. They talk to each other, interact, and act independently and even adversely. This cannot possibly fit the non-Cartesian consciousness model. I propose it also doesn't fit the split consciousness model. Why am I talking about this? It relates to my research question. We cannot understand the future if we don't understand identity, because without identity, who is there to see the future? The future may not even exist outside of perception by identity. Time exists as a whole dimension outside itself. To even conceive of the future, there must be an observer traveling through time, and that observer must have an identity in some shape or another, and the construction of that identity affects time perception. So back to what I was talking about. Where Jackson fails is in trying to map Lane onto a world of singular identity. 
Far superior is the heteronym understanding mentioned earlier in the paper from Ashun. Uh, there is not a many lanes theory, nor are the lanes fractured into fractured parts of one whole psyche. Lane is inherently multiple. Remember that she is literally a program, not born as a singular mass from a human body at some point like we were. She was manifested from the wired, but in a, ma in a manner such that she was placed as if she already existed. Lane is a delusion of herself. She imagines at the start of the show her lack of knowledge of Navi and the wired, but of course she ought already to know any everything. She creates miracles, such as appearing in the sky or manipulating the pattern of spilled liquid. At one point, she demonstrates direct control over time by resetting reality and the memories of almost everyone within it. Is this the work of Superman or hyperstitional delusion? The second makes much more sense thematically. Lane clearly exhibits symptoms of dissociative identity disorder, and yet she also affects the real world and the wired concretely. Her delusions are shown to manifest. It is not that far then to go from there to where she deluded herself into existence this is the show's explanation of all human consciousness the self is a delusion created by sternerite creative nothing sterner 1844 which manifests itself but is inherently inconsistent plastic and also distributed this is key in the words of lane herself quote no matter where you go everyone is connected according to sel at least there simply is no such thing as singular self the diegetic sounds of club siberia bring the show to life almost literally which words are repeated at the start of every episode? Present day, present time. The truth is, Ezio was never presenting a vision of the future. It was manifesting the present in new ways so as to produce itself. This is the final puzzle piece which allows Lane to create sonic futures and the solution as to avoiding representation of time and actually presenting time. An implicit acknowledgement that the future already exists in the present. You never go to the future, you just arrive in it or it arrives in you. Quote, Neo China arrives from the future, Lan 2011. In this case, Lane arrives from the future. The ambient sound mirrors the ever-present harm of power lines. It serves to metaphorize the show's thesis statement. The wire is already all around us, it always has been. In a few brief shots in layers 11 and 12, we can see strange spires rising out of the distance of Lane's environment. These spires are not man-made buildings. In fact, they may not be buildings at all. They may be interpreted as a physical manifestation of wired architecture infesting the meat space of the show. Why then do they seem so biological? Why the bulbous, almost melty, white gobules which form their exteriors? Don't they look kind of fungal? Over 400 million years ago, giant organisms called prototaxites existed on land. We're not entirely sure what they were, but it's clear that they were not any kind of vascular plant. One theory states that they were a type of fungus, Boyce et al. 2007. Mycologist Paul Stamet says in a blog post, Matter and life are based on network theory. The organization of galaxies, dark matter, neurons, roots, computer networks, social media, music, mathematics, and mycelium are all structured similarly. Even if you don't buy my admittedly tenuous theory on the spires specifically, the broader point still stands. Networks similar to the wired have been here long before humans and will almost certainly continue with after us. No matter where you go, everyone is connected. It would seem that this is also the case no matter when you go. How does SEL represent this sonically? Through text rhythmic ambience juxtaposed with heavy use of sonic negative space. When you hear the music of Siberia, the Schumann resonance techno babble frequencies aren't real, but their effect is. We can see this in the impact of SEO on culture, the countless art projects based on this show which embody or extend its sonic palette, for example, foe.neocities.org. Something in the textures makes people want to talk about it. It's built into the interplay of sound, visuals, and narrative. The music literally connects people to the wired. SEL's music is electronic, industrial, sometimes ambient, sometimes very much not, but always unusual and strongly textual. It goes beyond traditional Eurocentric conceptions of futurist music with a strong focus on texture rhythm and atypical percussion. To reject European visions of a beatless, sterile future reflected of the wired in Siberia, uh, a beatless sterile future. Reflected of the wired of Siberia, the future is a wild west of technological possibilities once you let go of the human. SEL's entire conception of identity and time are reflected through musical space, sparse percussion, and ethereal electronic sound design. This serves to reorient the, view the viewer away from the anthropos from anthropocentrism. Uh, the comforts of the human have been taken away and replaced with the machinic beauty of the post-human wired. Rather than looking to existing genre tropes or ghosts of promised futures, SEO is acutely aware of the musical underground and accelerates in ex its existent feedback loops into the next stage. 
This all leads into a thesis that the future exists in the present, and it is the limits of the illusion of singular identity which prevent us from accessing it. SEO understands that silence is discomfort, the human cannot be satisfied with empty space, and uses this as a tool to point us in the direction of the cyborg, and the future of heteronymic multiplicity of identity. The time manipulation of breakbeat, drum samples, and techno serve to reinforce post-human temporalities. No human drummers play western instruments, human vocals lie dormant and unimportant beneath the rhythms of the wired. Conclusion SEL creates sonic futures additively, layering new, uncanny and post-human sounds on top of the solid hyperrhythmic foundations provided by electronic music of the day as examined by Ashun. Oh fuck. I need to add something to my fucking... I need to resubmit it because there's a mistake here. As compared to a utopian science fiction work like 2001 A Space Odyssey, SEO avoids cliches of, of orchestral instrumentation and conventions. Rather than emulating the current world, the current with synths and drum machines, SEO leans towards the creation of novel, synthetic models of sound. These sounds are synthesized from the machines of the present, just as the future is synthesized from the machines of the present. With its heavy focus on rhythm, SEO produces time image. I have discussed the ways the tracks of bootleg CD me me mechanically create those sounds through a musical and philosophical analysis. I have critiqued and commented on existing literature related to SEL The Show, the pre-existing context for science fiction music, and relevant philosophy. SEL's music is not only a departure from trends in science fiction, but also of Eurocentrism in scoring practices, with its focus on non-European sounds and rhythms. I have also added my own analysis of SEL's philosophy and sound to make up for the lack of existing writing on this particular subject. More research is needed into both the sound of this anime in particular and the philosophy of sound of sonic futures in general.